For 40 years, we have been lied to about women and men, about domestic violence, about sexual assault, about privilege, about rights, even about the very idea of equality. Erin Pitsy, who founded the world's first internationally recognized battered women's shelter, has known all along that something's wrong because she witnessed the change herself back in the early 1970s. Today, she talks to many younger men and women who have been hurt by hateful and dishonest gender ideology, and she has a question for them. When did you wake up? And how long have you been awake? And of course, what should we do about it now? Welcome to When Did You Wake Up with Erin Pitsy and her co-host, Dean Esme. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to the Saturday, January 3rd, 2015 episode of When Did You Wake Up with Aaron Pitsy. I, as usual, am Aaron's co-host, Dean Esme. Uh, how you doing this afternoon slash evening, Aaron? I'm fine. It's cold, uh, but I'm okay. I've got the traditional cup of tea, and so I'm set to go. I woke up late this morning, so I'm still on my coffee. <laughs> uh, we got, our, believe it or not, here in Michigan, we've only just gotten our first snow. So Good. I cannot believe it's 2015. I don't know about you, but uh, when I was younger, I expected by now I'd be able to buy tickets to the moon. Uh, <laughs> for goodness sake, 2015. I can hardly believe it. I feel like I'm getting old. Um, so anyway, uh, we don't have a whole lot of updates on whiteribbon.org for people simply because we're just getting through the holidays. Um, we have a number of things planned. Of course, we're still seeing the occasional attack in the press claiming, uh, there's some kind of, uh, shenanigans going on because there's other groups calling themselves white ribbon who are sending a different message than Aaron's white ribbon.org does, but, um, uh, Take it from us. They're full of it. All WhiteRibbon.org, which doesn't even accept donations or advertising at this time, does is tell the truth, uh, which is that domestic violence is not a gendered issue. It's a family issue, and um, it affects everybody, but especially children. I can let you know, Aaron, that uh, we have a group of Australian volunteers. White Ribbon is an all-volunteer effort. Um we have a group of volunteers in Australia who are putting together an infographic to give the basics that people need to understand what domestic violence really looks like from a scientific perspective and should be able to give it to them in one go, in just one image. So yes, that's as exciting. Against, yeah, as against all the brainwashing that's been going on for so long, because all those figures actually have no authenticity at all. They're just pulled out of thin air. So we just need people to be able to very quickly look at the genuine evidence-based figures from across the Western world. And well, it'll, I will prove, hmm? it'll prove what we've always said. It is generational. And it, the, the tragedy is that parents unwittingly, because of their behavior, infect their children. And this cycle of violence goes on and on. And the great news is that it's possible to treat it and stop it. That's right. I will give you. I will give a bit of argument with you. Um, some of the figures that the ideologues used aren't exactly pulled out of thin air. They just do the nice little trick of omitting any numbers involving male victims. Uh, so they're accurate so far. Sometimes they're accurate so far as well. Yes, this many women got hit, or this many women got killed. And then conveniently, let's just not talk about the men, and everybody will continue to believe the stupid lie that domestic violence is about men against women. Yeah, but that still is inaccurate because, as you say, it doesn't produce the whole picture. Right. It's like lying by telling a half-truth. Sometimes a half-truth is a bigger lie than an outright fabrication. I think that's true, yeah. 
Oh. Anyway, that's what we're doing, and it's taking a lot of time, but we will get there, so I hope everybody's going to be patient. That's right, and there's already plenty of good information on whiteribbon.org. So, Aaron, now let huh? me tell you about our guest today, who I know you have not met before. Nope. Um, may have heard a little bit about uh, Nick Redding, also known all throughout the Internet as Eric Duckman. Eric is Eric, Nick, Nick, Eric. We'll just call him Eric. Eric is one of the founders and the chief movers behind Men's Rights Edmonton, mm -hmm. a, 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 an advocacy group based in uh, the Canadian province of Alberta, mm -hmm. uh, specifically around the city of Edmonton, which I believe is Alberta's largest city. Um, I've, been following, I've been following Eric's antics for a few years now, um, and antics is the right word, wouldn't you say, Eric? Some of it anyway. Uh, a lot, um, much of it, yes. Much of it is antics, which is a way of getting attention. He's famous for walking around with a po uh, a sandwich board and uh, going to feminist rallies and just asking questions. And of course, they always say crazy things about him: uh, rapey, misogynisty, beady woman beater. I think the funniest thing I've seen in in, in Eric's activism has been repeat claims by feminists. The men of Men's Rights Edmonton are too cowardly to come out in public or show their faces. Um, and Eric has a couple of times caught them on camera and said, Hi, my name is, and this is my face. <laughs> when was the first time you did that, Eric, in well, response? I, the first time, I think, I can only think of one instance uh, that I, I, I mean, like, there, there have been a couple times I confronted them over the internet and said, "This is my face," you know, for anyone who's curious. Uh, but there, the, at the last, the 2014 slut walk was when I confronted uh, Danielle Boudreau, um, a professional victim uh, who sat on a panel with um, with uh, Staff Sergeant Shauna Grimes. Uh, the, the head of the Edmonton Sexual Assault Division of uh, the Edmonton Police Service, um, and uh, uh, oh, Lise Gattel, Professor Lise Gattel from the University of Alberta. Uh, she is referenced in Elizabeth Sheehy's book, uh, Defending Battered Women on Trial. Um, and um, Horrid book. What's his name? Uh, uh, Ryan Jesperson, a local television personality from Breakfast Television on Global TV. Uh, and they, they all sat around uh, five weeks uh, after after Rain came out saying that there was no rape culture to talk about rape culture and how we can stop it. Uh, uh, in yes. case anybody doesn't know, Elizabeth Sheehy is the law professor who wrote an entire book about why women basically should be allowed to kill their husbands. Um, yeah, we have that here. Yeah. Yeah, we have yeah. a, we have a group called Justice for Women. And you actually find them right the way across the Western world. They're all, our lot are all barristers and solicitors because if a woman kills her partner, she is actually not guilty of murder because she's a political prisoner because of the patriarchy that oppresses all women. And uh, this, Aaron, and, yeah? Go ahead. I, 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 when, I, when I first got into the movement around 2009, 2010, um, I, I I found this uh, this movie. It's a, it's a British movie called Provoked. Have you heard of it? No. You must. You have. To, I haven't seen it. I've only seen the previews. Uh, it's got the the guy from Cracker. Uh, I've no, never it, seen. I haven't heard of it. It's never been, as far as I know. Is it on television or is, is no, it's, a, it's a it's a biopic about about uh, an Indian couple who emigrates to to England. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, because the the man was apparently abusive, and, and the, the, the husband was apparently abusive, the woman poured a napalm like substance over. Oh his yes, now I know this is based on a real case. Yes, yeah. she and, actually, and she came back to set him alight. It was a very very premeditated murder, and they and, did get her out of prison. Yeah, yeah, and and gave her a a freaking award. So it's she, the same group. It's the same group. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah, and it has, and it has, like, it has a high, high name act. Like, again, the, the guy from Cracker, I don't know his name. The, the actor, he's a, he's a heavy set uh, English man with, with uh, dark gray hair. Play, usually oh. plays a 
I don't, I don't remember them, but I do, I do remember the case, and I remember them. Uh, and, and of course, the one, the most biggest name you've got, who's involved in liberating uh, murderous women, is called Leonora Walker from Denver, and she's made that, and she's part of all that. She's no doubt in that book. But I mean, I, right. I, I think before we get settled into solving that, I need to find out when in your life you began to first wake up. Yep, I just wanted to mention one more thing, which is that on Mondays, Eric also does some a radio show with the Boys for Men called The Vanguard Ho- Report, which he co-hosts with Fiona Bogan. All that was just background, so yes, let's get right to Aaron's actual question, because this is about it. When did you wake up, Eric? Well, again, uh, you know, I listened to the, the episode with Al Martin the other day, and just like uh, what I found was that, just like him, I mean... With me, there was no real red pill moment. I mean, I, I can remember back to 1993 when I was in third grade. Um, How old is that? How old is that? Uh, eight years old. Okay, eight, yeah. Um, and me and all the other boys in the class, whenever whenever the, the teachers would say some clearly, uh, uh, you know, sexism, uh, benevolent benevolently sexist things towards girls, we would all have this collective moment of, of, you know, this seems to be that sexism thing that we're hearing about so much, except, it, you know, it seems to be the other way. And, and of course, the, the teachers would respond to that with, you know, we're not perpetrating sexism, we're correcting it. Uh, have, you got, have you got an example that you can give? Yeah, yeah. There was, uh, there's, uh, there was, a, there, there was, and is a uh, a, uh, a scholarship program um, called. It was called Wise when I was a kid. Now it's called Wisest. Uh, it's, it's an acronym for Women in Science, Engineering, Technology. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and it, it was, it, you know, it was, to, <coughs> it was to correct the disparity you know, of you know women in STEM fields. Yeah. Right. And, uh, uh, you know, we're looking around going, well, gee, the only male teacher here, we got a male principal, and there's the, there's the class with the, uh, the mentally handicapped kids and the kids with serious behavior problems. They have a female and a male teacher. And uh, the male teacher, he's a nice guy, but he's a big, strong dude, and he's basically an orderly as well as a mm-hmm. teacher. You know, he grabs mm-hmm. them and puts them in the padded room when they start freaking out. Mm-hmm. You know, so where, where's the initiative to get more, more male teachers in? Because we all wanted more male teachers. Right. Well, you know, uh, Eric, what happened here is that one of the problems for getting male teachers is, as one of our ministers for women said, she said, um, we do need more men in primary schools, but unfortunately men can't be trusted with children. And, you know, again, I didn't have to, be, I didn't have to hear anything like that. I was, mm-hmm. I was well aware of mm-hmm. that. I was, even before I heard of the men's rights movement or anything like that, I was saying things like, you know, gee, we could have more men in schools, but we're a bunch of pedophiles, aren't we? Mm. You know? Yeah. And just coming from your family, because you sound, for an eight-year-old, you sound very, very turned on, politically. Uh, well, you know, in, um, I, I tell people that I, I, I was raised social justice warrior. Mm. Um, it, and I was. Uh, my dad is, uh, my dad and all of his um, siblings, they're, they're, they're a quarter Mohawk, but they're very visibly native. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, as opposed to me, who's on quite blonde, um, uh, you know, I, um, so I grew up with native issues being huge. My dad was a total communist, anti-gun, anti-hunting, pro-union. Uh, he took me to Cuba when I was 18 years old so that I could see the last country to stand up against American imperialism. Wow, that is a background. That really is. Yeah, and and it's and how great to have a very powerful father figure in your life. Uh, well, you know. Yes he, and no. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes and no. Again, uh, he was a uh, he was a he's a uh, he was he's a retired uh, fire captain mm. uh, from Edmonton, Alberta. But even still, I mean, the first time I can still remember the first time I heard the word exploitation, mm. he and my brother were taking me aside and telling me that pornography exploited women's bodies. That's why he was wrong, and uh, and he would uh, you know we would have long drives together to talk you know have have father son talks, 
you know, we would, if we would pass a, a strip club, we would, we would just, just see with, with mallets at, at the existence of a place like that. And, you know, again, it was, it was all exploitative towards women, you know, and how I should never go into such a hive of scum and villainy. Uh, um, so how did that happen with his uh, his sensitivity and his understanding uh, that he does have, uh, and and not not understand that you know that p- people have and this is the whole porn argument actually I find extraordinary partly because all my life in, in within the refuge movements that I've run, um, at least a quarter of the women coming in are women who are self professed they're, they're, they're sex workers. And they don't want anybody messing with their lives. They make their own decisions about their bodies. So yeah. where does that where, where does well, that leave this idea that you know it's only what men do? It is only, it, well, explain it to me, Eric. Well, I, I mean, uh, I think you can hear you can hear uh, Karen uh, do a great job of explaining this, but I'll do it. Um, they are they have to be the big strong men, mm. but they've been told that that's wrong. Mm. But they have to do it. But that's wrong. But they mm. have to do it. <laughs> it's really confusing, isn't it? <laughs> uh, um, not not when you understand they're completely full of shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so there. So you have th- this relationship with your father. Where does your mother in that spectrum? Well, um, you know, I'm listening to your background about the the, the Irish and English combination is mm. very interesting. Um, my dad, uh, you know, again, he, he, bunch of brown kids, but um, <sighs> my family is almost entirely English. Um, mm. uh, the, you know, the Reddings, of course, Nick Redding, um, and my, my mother's side of the Collings, and of course, the Collings married the Brightons, so mm. we're all very English. Mm. Uh, and uh, but my 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 grandfather on my dad's side was half uh, half English immigrant and half Mohawk. Um, and if he married uh, an Irish Catholic from uh, Newfoundland. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, uh, so they had a very uh, um, the, the mother, of course, was the the household figure because she was Irish Catholic. She raised all the kids Catholic. My dad was an altar boy, and he mm. was the he was the, the the oldest of seven Catholic kids mm. who raised in a housing project in Toronto. Mm. Um, and my mother was the youngest, uh, was the younger child of two um, Protestant girls raised in the suburbs. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, the best I can figure, she was she was looking to date a, a, a bad brown guy to piss off her parents. Yep, that happens. <laughs> that happens. That really does. Yep. Um, so. Uh, so they're, they're, you know, she would, she would get angry at him, uh, because of, you know, when, when he wasn't, when he wasn't, you know, when, when his, his victimhood, uh, for being native, you know, stopped being fashionable and, and the Irish thing came up in the, the mid nineties with like Ashley McIsaac and Riverdance and his Irishness was a big deal. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so, and, you know, her feminism was a big deal. So, you know, uh, it, it was, it, it, it was something that belonged on, uh, on um, Dr. Random Rickham's victim fight series. Mm. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, my mother was, she, uh, my dad worked two jobs. He, he was mm. a fire, he, he worked on the fire department and he worked as a stock boy at uh, Costco, which is a, a major warehouse uh, outlet. Um, and uh, like a shopping outlet. And my mother, so my mother could, uh, take uh, time off from her secretary job. She was a professional secretary. She went from she was very good at it actually. She went from secretary job to secretary job, but she took time off to raise me mm-hmm. when I was you know from one to one to five. Mm-hmm. So she was. So it's actually a very politicizing background that you had. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I. Um, you know, I've mentioned in my videos that, that before I did the men's rights movement, I was in the, the, the marijuana legalization movement. Uh, you saw me in the video. I've got dreadlocks forming now. Uh, it's the fourth time in my life I've had dreads. Um, and uh, I, uh, 
I was very, very left wing. I was a social justice warrior myself, right up until just before Occupy. Mm-hmm. Actually, uh, I was very dis. I, I was I, I, in two thousand nine because uh, I, I I was involved. Actually, it's funny because when I watch um, when I when I watch conversations between uh, uh, Lucien Valsan and uh, and Paul Elam when they talk about their uh, when they talk about politics, Lucien Valsan all the way over there. He's talking about the, the violent nature of the anarcho syndicalists. Yeah. Yeah. And even in case during- anybody doesn't know, Lucien Valsan is lives in Romania. He is Romanian and he grew up under the repressive communist regime there. And, and here anyway. in Edmonton Yeah, here in Edmonton with my far left leanings, you know, I was volunteering for the NDP at fifteen years old. Mm-hmm. Um uh and I you know, um the 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 um, anarcho syndicalists they're, they're 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 the wobblies here in Edmonton, mm-hmm. you know, the wobblies, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and for anyone who doesn't know, they're the industrial workers of the world. They're one big union. They're anarcho communists, mm-hmm. and uh, they've got a major influence over punk rock culture, not just mm-hmm. in Edmonton but all over the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was kind of involved with them, but I was I was too socially awkward. For them to get involved, so I was kind of I was involved with some of their their peripheral friends, uh, just just like the, the Mormons or the Scientologists. There's degrees of getting mm-hmm. to know. And uh, um, a friend of mine, uh, well, you know, um, uh, well, I'm, I'm getting things confused here. There's a lot of veins I wanted to talk about. Um, Stick to, I think you, it, the thing that's fascinating to people is how you got to where you are, particularly when I was talking to somebody like you, who, as you say, has so many strands. Yeah. Uh, what was it that finally narrowed down your commitment to making it men's issues? Well, it, again, there, there, it, it, it's a progression. When I, was, when I was about 10, 11, my parents got divorced, and mm-hmm. every I would come home from school, and it would be a giant fight with my mom every day. Between you and your mom? Sorry? Was that between you and your mom, the fight? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Why? Uh, I, was doing, I was always doing poorly in school. Uh, I would never do my homework. Um, and, you know, she had her own problems, which I'm about to get into here. Uh, yeah. Again, you know, you, you when I listen to other stories in the men's movement in terms of physical violence, mm. I, no, like I got spanked. That's pretty much it. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, I, I'm quite lucky to you not know, have. But uh, um, again, uh, one day when I, I caught, I got home. You know, there was a fight. My mother was, you know, towering over me in a corner. She was screaming at me, and I shoved. I had enough. I shoved her away from me, and she went and called her father, who was dying of cancer to tell him that I had punched her. And yeah. that was when I became very, very skeptical yeah. uh, of any of those claims, mm. seeing that my own mother could do this to me and, uh, and not have any problem with it. And uh, um, uh, then a couple of years of you know, getting involved, staying with the left-wing community and, and all that, and they're, they're the punk rock left-wing community, I got involved with like street punks, like homeless teenagers. Mm. And uh, um, I went out to, I, I moved into a, a house, you know, this is a contradiction in terms of a house full of homeless kids, uh, but I moved into a house with them, and then when that house fell apart, I moved out to, uh, the, the homeless kids tend to uh, 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 migrate between Edmonton and Victoria. The Edmonton mm-hmm. has the money, but it's cold, really cold in the winter. Victoria yes, yes. is nice all year round. Yeah. So when it gets too cold in Edmonton, the kids migrate to Victoria. So you've got this back and forth. So I just I just went out to Victoria. I, I had two hundred dollars in my pocket. I took a Greyhound bus out to to Victoria, and uh, um, I got off the bus. And I, the first panhandling kids I could find, they said, "Do you guys know where Little Maid of Allen is?" They said, "Yeah." They took me right to him. <laughs> And uh, uh, and so I stayed with them under, under a bridge for a little while, and then I moved out from under the bridge. And they moved into a house, and these all these kids. There, there, there was this guy at the house who lived at the house. 
the, being from England, you know that the, the, the skinhead movement is very sophisticated. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's, it's really just a small minority that are white nationalists. Mm-hmm. And this, this guy at the house was a, he was a sharp, a skinhead against racial prejudice. Yeah. Everybody, uh, so all the, um, and there, there was a, there was a New Year's party where one of the street kids, a, a, an alcoholic girl named uh, Tuesday, and she showed up and started assaulting people with a garbage can. And the third person she attacked was this sharp, and he was trained in kung fu, and he completely messed her up. And uh, so all of her friends uh, from a group called the Scum Crew, which is a very apt name for them, uh, broke down our house, uh, the door to the house two weeks after I moved in, and beat this guy in his bed with clubs. And uh, I. I was somewhat naive at the time. I mean, I still I, I knew all the guys, I, I, and I saw every one of them. And when the cops came and asked what happened, I gave them every one of their names. So I had to leave town. Mm-hmm. Um, and I came back to Edmonton, and then I, you know I come back to Edmonton, you know re- reconnect with my you know left, far left wing community. Um, and uh, my friend, who was living in a house with a bunch of wobblies, who are of course de facto feminists, he did very well with women. And uh, he uh, he made out with one of the one of the guy's girlfriends while they were both drinking on her birthday, and, and he was he was he felt cuckolded, so he went around telling all the guys that he got her he, he got her liquored up and took advantage of her, and they all implicitly believed it. They didn't talk with him, and he was he was re- he, he wasn't violent, but he was removed from the house. He was he was told to leave. He was given so much time before he had to go. And that that there was really the final straw. For me. I I uh, I you know I, that that instance sat with me for years until in 2009 I googled uh, I, I started looking up anti-feminists. I was going there. There has to be there has to be an organized resistance to this somewhere. I have to meet these people. Mm. So. I started looking up, I started Googling um, anti-feminist, and I, I got, you know, a couple things, and I Googled the word misogynist, and I found mm. Paul Ewing's channel, The Happy Misogynist. Right, well done. <laughs> well, yeah, that that's a real moment, isn't it? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, uh, uh, and then from there, um, I, you know, I mean, I, I started listening, you know, I, just uh, consuming everything I could. I was, I was, I was listening to the newest Beetle Bogan video. I was listening to the newest Barbarossa video, and I, I, I was watching you on um, Man, Woman, Men. Yeah. I should uh, mention to people, by the way, um, Paul Ewan, some years ago, although he dropped the title, he used to go by the humorous title, The Happy Misogynist. And what he would say is, in the modern world, the definition of a, a, a misogynist is anybody who thinks that women are intelligent, capable, responsible adults and should be expected to live that way or to act that way. So that was sort of an in-joke, in case anybody didn't get it. Anyway, please go on. Yeah, and uh, so I'm consuming these things. And I'm consuming there. And, um, you know, finally, because before, before I heard the term social justice warrior, I, w- I had my own terms for these people. I was calling them uh, dogmatistas, uh, which of course is a, a play on zapatista, right? It, it's just it's just dogmatist in Spanish, but it, you know, it, it they 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 got it and it, it got under their skin, and that was enough for me. Um, and I was calling them the uh, the coffee house commission on on the hip activities, uh, which also pissed them off. Uh, who, yeah. So let let's put this into context. So at this point, how old are you? Um, I was I was twenty years old when the incident in Victoria happened, and that led you to looking for the information where you found out you found Paula Elam. Uh, that, well, the, the the final straw was when I got back to Edmonton and my friend. But even then, sorry, I left out a step. I mean, when I was in high school. Mm. There was, you know, like, some guys, uh, some guy came to me, and he was like, there's this guy at this other school, and he raped this chick, and we're going to fuck him up. And I'm like, well, well, how, how do you know, like, after my experience with my mom, I'm like, how do you know that that really happened? Mm. And he told me, 
straight up, which is reminiscent of all the stuff we're hearing about this 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 Rolling Stone college rape campus. He yeah. goes, it doesn't matter. We have to show that that sort of thing is unacceptable. Wow. I mean, that man's dead from the neck upwards, isn't he? And yeah, and I'm yeah, yeah, and I, you know, I'm 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 in high school, so I'm. Eight, 17, mm. 16, when I'm hearing mm. this, this is, mm-hmm. this is, this is a mess. This is mm. completely screwed up. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, so go ahead. At that time, so what, were, how, what sort of relationships were you having with the people around you? I have always been uh, uh, very socially uh, outcast. Mm-hmm. Um, it's only been in the last couple of years that I, 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 I mean, a little bit before I joined the men's rights community, uh, but I have always been, I'm, I'm 30 years old, I've never had a girlfriend. Uh, I've, I've done a lot of research into the psychology of loneliness and uh, depression and uh, uh, isolation and, and things like that. Uh, when I read, when I read 1984, just, just before I, I um, went out to Victoria, um, it blew me away that yeah. uh, um, that someone could write so eloquently about uh, uh, alien, social alienation. Yeah, but don't you think all of you who wake up young, and you woke up very young, you were only eight when you were beginning to recognize this huge fissure in society, really. It, it makes you isolated and lonely. Yeah, because... because- yeah, and 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 then trouble with men though, because they don't communicate with each other as women do, and they it makes them much more isolated socially. Because the majority of men will back off; they don't really want to hear it. And no, they, no, they don't back off; they go on the attack. Um, oh yeah, yeah, it's no. okay. But whatever, you're isolated <laughs> because they don't want to listen to what you have to say. Well, you know what I've noticed now. I, I mean, I'm 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 part of this growing movement online. I also have a serious problem with mandatory schooling. Um, oh yeah, I agree. Yeah, um, mandatory, mandatory brainwashing is what what I call it. Yeah, and because you know all of the abuse that I got when I was in grade six, people were telling me everybody hates you, nobody likes you, no one's ever going to like you, over and over and over again. And now I'm 30 years old, and now that I'm standing up in the men's rights movement, what am I hearing? You're ugly. Nobody likes you. Yeah. Nobody's ever going to like you. Jesus Christ. I put a, <laughs> And the thing is, you know, when I, I stood up to this stuff, and, and, and when, I was, when I was a kid, you know, or I stood up to it, got pushed around by it, whatever you want to call it, and, you know, I, I learned how to deal with it. You know, I'm looking around at these people. They never... They are my age, and they never learn how to deal with it, which is why they are so easily cowed by it. Because, actually, this is why I do this program. Most people are asleep because it's yeah. a very painful business to wake up, and particularly yeah. to wake up as young as you were. Yeah. Because you're, you, you wake up to, possibly in your area, being the only person that's thinking like you're thinking. Well, you know, my dad would kind of go back and forth. Like, mm. you know, he's, you know, he, when I started getting into this, he told me that I hated women, you know, and, uh, and he, you know, he would, he would say, you know, you're only doing this because you have issues with your mother. Like he would, like, of course I am, <laughs> but he would, he would throw that at me like a rock, you know, and but what, uh, what, what, if, he, if, if, well, if he obviously had issues with your mother, he wouldn't have divorced her. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And he told me, like, in the, like he told me that he, you know, his 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 escape was well planned. <laughs> like, he was he was planning that out for a long time. Yeah, but he didn't think that it was there. But a righteous attitude of yours to to have issues with your mother, because as far as I'm concerned, that's healthy. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing is that you know, in the in the late '90s, early 2000s, mm. you know. My dad would get into arguments with his his brother. My my uncle, by the way, is the he's the uh, director. Or he was a couple of years ago, at least the director of Indigenous Studies at the University of Victoria. Mm-hmm. Um, um, you know, and his wife, of course, was a feminine. And uh, um, my dad got into an argument with her and uh, about. Um, 
about the fire department and and letting women in because you know he always had a problem with with lowering the standards to let female firefighters in things like that um, and uh, because you know it could end up costing someone their life. Which well, it's and, it's actually about physical strength, isn't it? It's not actually discriminatory. It's just no. you have to know that the person next to you is strong enough to lift and carry heavy bodies. Yeah, and most yeah. women can't do that. Or 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 or, or push through a barrier or anything. Yeah, uh, yeah. But, uh, the uh, um, the you know he he, would, he got into an argument with her. You know she was of course defending all of these these feminist encroachments into the fire department. And you know he took me aside and he said she just hates male culture. That's it. Mm. Yeah. And. Um, and you know he would point out double standards in advertising to me when I was around the same time. Mm. He, would, he would, but you know it was just kind of between us, right? Mm. If you if you went out and talked with anybody about this, then you would snap and, and turn into one of them again. Mm. Mm. You know, it's it's a very difficult, lonely place to be. But then, but then I I do think now that it is becoming more and more apparent that what you saw and what you believed in and the way you defended yourself, and unusually, you didn't let yourself become ashamed. Oh, no. Oh, no, I, I did. Um, I, did you? I, I, uh, I've been uh, dealing with shame and, and researching shame for a long time. We uh, need to really think about that because I, don't, I can't tell you how many suicidal men I've talked to who are driven to suicide. Because of the well, feelings of shame. Yes, yes, and when I, uh, I, you know, I, before I, you know, before I got into the men's rights movement, I was looking at PUA stuff. Uh, mm. I, okay, I, you know, I, I don't do well with women. Let's let's look into this, mm. right? Um, and I, I also I also started researching the the, uh, the psychology of the psychological link between shame and uh, uh, between loneliness and depression. Mm-hmm. And so before I ever came across men's right, uh, men's right stuff, I, I came up, I, I came across the thing saying sh- the difference between shame and guilt mm-hmm. is that guilt is feeling bad about what you have done, and mm-hmm. shame is feeling bad about what you are. Yeah. And, and I have been arrested and taken to the hospital twice uh, for being suicidal, and. Um, the second time, my dad came and picked me up, and he told me that um, he told me that when I was three years old, uh, mm-hmm. we went to we went into a family friend's house, and I walked. You know, me and my mom and dad walked in through the front door, and I declared in front of Mike, the guy who owned the house, "I hate myself." Three years old. Wow. And can you pinpoint any of that and, and the beginnings of, did you ever understand, where did the shaming come from? Well, I, you know, I, I, um, just, to, just to conclude that thought, my dad, yeah. when, he, when he told me about that, what he, he also told me is that my mother immediately laughed it off and said that I was just doing it to, to get at her, which is a very odd thing to say. That's deeply narcissistic, isn't it? Yes. Deeply, because... Uh, it, it, also, it, it also really, uh, it's also very telling about... I, I don't remember what influenced me to say that, but it's very telling about where it came from, isn't it? Yeah. 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 And so, in, so in the middle of all this, when you were alone and, and feeling very suicidal... Where was your mother in all this? Had you just simply blocked her out of your life? Uh, no, I'm doing that now. <laughs> well, it's probably very healthy. Uh, uh, you know, it's an extraordinary thing to say, but I always believe that malignant relationships create malignant cells. And if somebody is malignant on your shining path, you have every right to ask them to step off. Well, you know, I... You know, she'd always done. And, you know, the, the more like the more I listen to Dr. Tara, yeah, the more I can put every conversation I've ever had with her into context. Mm-hmm. Um, when she said that borderline personalities 
um, they they don't see their own abusive behavior as abusive, but they see any defense of that behavior as abusive. Yes, I I was floored. Um, um, I I remember when I was 22, I got my mom. I I I I, I, I mentioned this on a, on a on a hangout with Doctor Doctor Paul with Paul and Doctor Tara. I said that I tricked her into going to a psychiatrist. I was I was I had been drinking. I was kind of full of bravado. Uh, I just suggested to her um, that we should go. That I said we should go to a psychologist, and her response, her response was, "You should go too." <laughs> oh, but then you see. But do you know anything about her own childhood? I mean, was uh, this generational? This pattern. My my dad. When I when I finally when I told when I came up to my dad about what happened. Um, with her falsely accusing me, he told me that her mother did that to her dad to, to control him. Yeah. And um, also, my grandmother suffered from Pick's disease, What's which that? it is it is it's it's more rare than Alzheimer's. It's a genetic brain disease that you're born with, but it manifests itself in old age. Mm. What it does is it slowly eats away at the parts of the brain that has reasoning and personality. Yeah. Wow. So my mother, my grandmother was always quiet mm. when I was growing up. And then that quietness and that, that removedness, um, it became much more obvious that it was a brain condition when she, you know, when she, she just stopped talking entirely. Mm. Uh, but I can completely see how someone who is physically, and I would wonder often, is my mo- does my mother have pick disease? Is that her problem? Mm. Because or, when I was, it just sounded um, to me though she was also deeply narcissistic, and the world had to revolve around her. Well, that's just it. She, I, I realize again later on when I read an article on AVFM about about being reasonably unreasonable. Mm. Uh, you know, that I had already come to the same conclusion, like observing my mother's behavior, engaging it. No, this is not a physical problem with the brain because it's obviously calculated. Mm. Yeah. Uh, um, but I can see how she might have been impacted by someone who was suffering from physical detriment to the part of the brain that has a reasoning and personality. Yeah, I agree, and I can understand all that. My my take on all that is, yes, you know, majority of people do have very traumatic childhoods because there's no such thing as perfect parents. But we all have a responsibility to take responsibility for our own behavior. Yes. So, and so therefore, it, people can't go on using it as an excuse. And, that's, and I, that's, go on, go sorry, on. yeah, go ahead. Well, but that's exactly it, is that I, I, I've been deeply interested in uh, uh, to <laughs> to the point of of of, uh, of un- being unhealthy. I've been deeply interested in Christianity, and what I now I'm starting to look at it more as a, as a um, as an allegory, you know. And they, they talk about forgiveness, and uh, you know, um, there's the man who came to Christ said, you know, how many. How many times should I forgive a man? You know, it says, well, if he come, if he sins against you, if your neighbor sins against you seven times in one day, and seven times repents, mm. then seven times forgive him. Mm. Right? How many? Mm-hmm. You know, what if he, you know, what if he sins against me this many times? Well, then forgive him seven, seven times, seven times. You know, but it's it's on the condition. Like everybody screws up. Everybody does bad things. I've done pretty awful things. The, the, you know, as long as you, you admit that what you've done, as long as you recognize it, you know, yeah. in front of everyone, that what you've done is wrong, mm. that's, you know, it, it's not okay, but it can get better. Yeah, I think the other thing, the other way to look at it, too, is that once <clears throat> I got old enough, <clears throat> uh, I was able to actually look at my mother and just feel this intense compassion and think, my God. To be have the life you had and to completely waste it in your utter narcissism and your refusal to do anything other than see yourself as a victim. 
Uh, and then there, that brought with it a forgiveness because she ruined her own life and ours, which well, did her best to ruin our lives. I think I was going to ask you, did you have a brother or a sister? Only child. Okay, that makes it even harder. The thing I've noticed, though, when with a mother relationship with children, how much more vulnerable the boy child is than the girl. Girls seem so much more resilient to their malfunctioning mothers. Um, and for the boys, though, it is, it is such a hard road to come to terms with it. And they're often the thing to, I suppose, to have to realize, and I, th I think I realized that with my mother, it wasn't that she didn't love us. She didn't know how to love because she'd never been loved. And this is where the generational issue comes in. Yes, the, 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 yeah. the crippling ignorance. Yeah. Uh, I don't mean in a pejorative way. I, no, yeah. no, but you're right. And, and emotional illiteracy. I mean, completely illiterate in terms of empathy for anybody else. Yeah. Yep. So put, take me down to, to now, now in your life. You're in Edmonton, which I told you I was there years ago. I did a tour of American of, Amer of Canadian men's movements with Anne Cools, who's your senator. And uh, we, I got to Edding. She stayed in Ottawa, and I was sent to Edmonton. And I was supposed to be doing some kind of um, speechifying thing. And I saw all these pickets outside your social, what you call, we call social services. You call them child services, do you? Uh, I, uh, I, I, child I, protection, I think. I, and I, I, and I remember, sounds, yeah, sorry, go on. That sounds more like an American term. I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, I, I, it was, it was your social services that your, your, who, who actually, who get involved with families and they were heavily, heavily feminist. And at that point they were making sure that none of the fathers were able to see their children. So I remember joining the picket and uh, just thinking to myself, Edmonton, as far as I could see, was actually riven with extremely, extremely rabid feminists. And what an awful climate to have to try and be normal and to have, the, and to have something like a family which contained a mother and a father and children under one roof. Because part of that point, and this is about 15 years ago, it was deeply unfashionable. Yes. Yeah. 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 When I was when I was a kid growing up, I, I told this to a, uh, uh, a, a Croatian reporter for a Croatian feminist magazine that she came and interviewed me and Raz. Said, you know, and Raz, he's uh, he's of Dutch background, and so his family is is uh, 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 Christian Reformed Church. Mm. Um, and so I, I you know, I. I um, said, you know, when I was a, a kid growing up, I was the kid whose parents were not divorced. Mm. And and then my, my parents got divorced. Mm. Uh, and Raz, of course, his parents are still married. Mm. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Very anomalous to stick together. So where are you now in your sort of life's journey? Would you put yourself? You're 30, you say. I'm 30. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, well, now I... You know, I, I don't mean this as a as a poor me type of thing, but I've looked at my life. I've looked at I've looked at the way I've lived it. Um, I don't. This is especially relevant given that uh, you know Paul Elam and Aaron Clary just talked about men abusing MGTOW. Yeah. And using using MGTOW as an excuse for their their social failures. I'm, I I I fully admit to my. Uh, uh, my social failures. In fact, I, what I like to say is that when I um, the, the difference between me and and, and people who uh, do well socially but fall prey to all this crap, say uh, uh, there but for my lack of social graces go I. Uh, um, I I'm just I, I don't want to have kids. Uh, I'm just. Flying my life into uh, the battleship that is this society. That's it. I can see that, but I see. I the, when you're talking about lack of social skills, well, why would you have social skills? Because you weren't in a family situation necessarily taught skills that you could see were particularly beneficial to society. When you have uh, a dysfunctional mother, what do you learn? You haven't any normal tools. I mean, I. I had, 
absolutely, I was, that's why I wrote a memoir called Infernal Child. I was extraordinarily violent as a child. And I think, that, and why not? I mean, that was my attitude to, to what was happening in the turmoil that I was living in. And I think to this day, I don't have the same set of social skills as other people. And to be honest with you, and I think you'll find this, if you stop thinking of it as a, a drawback and start thinking of yourself as a very free spirit, because you're not bogged down with all those brainwashed things that people have and, and, and are forced to be, to fit into this very sick society that we've created. Well, I, I have, I have done that. I have, I have started looking at it as, as, uh, as, a, uh, as an advantage. Mm. Um, uh, it, you, you, are you familiar with my "I Love Sluts" stunt? No. <laughs> I went uh, uh, in 2013. Um, I, I, I wore my sandwich board and I took my friend Dave down mm. to the, the 2013 slut walk. Yeah. We were because we were sitting around. We're going. How how will how do we with with our few numbers? What do we do to make an impact on the 2013 slut walk? You know, mm -hmm. they'll go there with a message of support. They'll never That's see it. Brilliant. Right. Always <laughs> kiss your, always kiss your enemies. <laughs> yeah, it works every time. And so we went down there, and I, I I had my men's rights Edmonton sandwich board, and this was right after the "Don't be that girl" thing. So everybody yeah. knew everybody knew who we were, and I had a sign that said "I heart sluts." Oh, lovely. <laughs> and uh, Dave had a sign that said, I heart boobs and hooray for sluts. <laughs> I think and, that's brilliant. And uh, I knew because you know, um, I, I, um, I knew that no matter what we said from my experience, no matter what we said, they were going to try to find, they were going to impute villainy. Yes. Onto us, no matter what. Yes. And the best part is, I didn't, I didn't know this at the time. The, the, the organizer of the slut walk, Danielle Peratti, had a sign that said "Jesus Heart Sluts," <laughs> and she, <laughs> and she came and got a picture taken with us. Brilliant. <laughs> and 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 uh, and everybody got outraged. You, you, if you go onto my YouTube channel, you can see the conversation. It's hilarious. You can see them trying to find something wrong with what we're saying, and I'm just responding to them very rationally. And. Well, that Go ahead. I was just going to say the anarchic ability to cause people to laugh. That is probably the strongest weapon you'll ever have. Mm. Mm. And I think that, you have a whole future now. Well, actually. and, and that, you know, what, what you said earlier um, about, uh, you know, just getting people to look at, yeah. um, at, at the, 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 the whiteribbon.org site, just getting them to look and see just for an mm. instant. Mm. You know, because because as soon as they realize what they're looking at, the the wetware is going to kick in, and they're they're gonna they're gonna start blocking things out. You know, ignorance is strength. Ignorance is strength. Uh, but if you can if you can pierce the echo chamber for a moment, yeah, you can say awfully dangerous things when you joke. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think that sounds to me like a strength that you have. Well, thank you. Um, you know, uh, uh, you know, my, my uh, Typhon, uh, Allison Tiemann has commented on my my uh, um, my ability to uh, come up with a, a snappy comeback. You know, when I'm when I'm trying to make a point, I I, I stutter and stumble. But you know, <laughs> uh, as you can see, uh, in fact, uh, also I would I would encourage you to go watch me and uh, me and Dean. Uh, at the uh, in in the middle of the feminist uh, counter demonstration in Toronto in 2014. I did. I saw that. Oh, oh, that was. <laughs> I did. We pushed. Uh, we pushed our luck a little there. We probably shouldn't have done that, but it was funny. It was funny. <laughs> yeah, she told she this one feminist. She told me to. She told me to. Uh, she, she she. We were talking about my sign. She told. She said, "Take it off." And I go, "Did you just tell me to take it off?" <laughs> Uh, Eric was wearing his men's rights Edmondson shirt uh, sign, and um, a bunch of feminist protesters were protesting and saying "MRAs go away" and, and other things like that. And he got in with them and was chanting with them. Didn't one of them say, "Hey, you're on the wrong side, dummy"? I, 
It was you. You said you said you're on the wrong side, dummy. It was you. Oh right. Yeah, that was me, wasn't it? But I wasn't oh, talking to you. I wasn't talking to you though. I was but anyway. No, I know, I know. Um <laughs> But getting back into that uh, about um, people seeing you as, as villainous, again, I, you know, when I was 22 years old, the big moment for me was when I, you know, I got my mom to come, I got my, me and my mom, we went to go see a psychiatrist, psychologist. Yeah. And, um, she had a couple of, she had a couple of sessions with him so she could prep him before I ever showed up. Right. Right. And so there. And he's going, Nicholas, I, I understand you smoke marijuana. Are, are you high right now? You know? <laughs> oh, God. Very, yeah. you know, uh, um, you know, and, you know was, and, and so, um, and then one of the, one of the sessions, you know, she's, she's paraphrasing me in a, uh, in a deep voice, right? A characteristically deep voice. And uh, I go, I go, it just out of nowhere, I go, you know, my, my voice really isn't that deep. Come on. And it's just, Nicholas. And in the next session, the, the, the doctor, he asked us, is there anything from the last time you want to talk about? And I said, yes, last time when I said my voice isn't that deep, and you said, Nicholas, what had I done wrong? Mm-hmm. And I could see it on, on the, like, I could see the expression on, on the psychologist's face. Like, holy shit. This is what's going on, and um, and you know, I just I reflect on that a lot. And like, hang on, when when you say that, just, just dissect that for me. He, you're looking at him, and you're and you and you think he's thinking, "Holy shit, what's going on? What does he mean by you think he like, meant?" Like he's a professional, and he's been taken by your mother. Yeah, and and Good. and and he's like realizing now. Yeah. And then, you know, so then he started actually putting his, putting his education to work. Mm. And, uh, uh, you know, um, actually listening to me mm-hmm. and, you know, going like asking me questions like, Nick, what do you, you know, um, when I, when I pointed out that there's a difference between a fight and an argument, he said, Nick, articulate, what is that? What is the difference between a fight and an argument? I said, well, an argument is when you're both putting your, perspectives on the table yeah um and a fight is when you're just trying to hurt somebody mm-hmm. sandra are you are you hearing this are you listening to this well you're very lucky to have got him because unfortunately <laughs> most of them are so brainwashed yeah by the feminist teachings the other thing that i think is quite important for somebody like you is that you're you're very brave and very honest because most men would put pins in their eyes rather than look honestly at their mothers because men are taught to think of women as sacred. Yep. And that is why the women's movement has been so strong, because this men's attitude is that I will not look at what my mother did, because she is sacred. She is my mother. And those are the men that die from it. Yeah, and there's, there's a, um, a voice for men has put out a meme Yeah. satirizing a... Uh, Domestic violence advertisement saying uh, it's, a, it's a young kid in a baseball uniform and a young boy, and he's saying, uh, Nobody messes with my mom. Mm. Right? You know, your mother wears army boots. Mm. You know, your mother. All you have to say is your mother. That's it. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I know, and there's so many men who are alcoholics when they stand up and they're trying to explain what happened in the childhood where the mother was particularly disturbed and, and in many cases emotionally very incestuous towards them, they find that there's ice-cold response and you're not allowed to say it. And I do think that kind of, we have to break that silence. And that's where a voice for men is so incredibly, it's so incredibly exciting for people when they do find it because the voice there is very, very honest and it's rumbuxed, and it's rude, and it's all the things that it needs to be, because it takes away this feeling of shame, because men for so long have been silent. Well, you know, the way I look at it is, if, if you know what, okay, you know, to, to use the, 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 the parlance of MGTOW, okay, another rape, if you're, if you're going to be pushed around by mm-hmm. shame, 
and things like that. If if if, if the if the the wealth of 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 valid arguments that I'm making are not going to do one bit, mm. well, I'm fine. I can I can make fun of you. I can insult your manhood too. Watch me, mm. and I can do a much better job of it than them. Um, I must say, I do find MGTOW an, an organ, and I absolutely understand where men are coming from. And uh, and I, as far as I'm concerned, I think it's going to MGTOW is going to expand and grow as more and more men simply turn away from being exploited. Yes. Yeah, you can hardly blame them, and you're not going to stop them by shaming them. You're really not. No, absolutely. No, nobody should shame them. The question should be asked: Why? Why? What? What has created this climate? Where the gulf between men and women is so huge, it's almost un- unbridgeable. I, I would, I would actually, you know, I call myself Eric Duckman. Uh, mm-hmm. Has been covered. I would really, I'm naming myself. I, I, I took that name from a cartoon from the '90s. Yeah. Uh, uh, from the same name, Duckman, and uh, it was written by the people who wrote The Simpsons, mm-hmm. and they they put what they couldn't put in The Simpsons in Duckman. Mm-hmm. And it was Duckman was voiced by um, uh, Jason Alexander from Seinfeld. Right, brilliant. And uh, he was Duckman was uh, he was a you know a short um, you know a, a presumably Jewish actually no they confirm in the episode that he, in the show that he's Jewish uh, anthropomorphized duck um, and he you know he. He's he's full of bravado and he's uh, he's offensive to everyone, and uh, you know he walks around just just pissing everybody off. And he's known you know, that you know this is he's known for for infuriating the world. Uh, but then when you actually listen to what he has to say, it's it's uh, it's very telling. Um, and there's there is an episode where because he he his he raises his children. He's a widower. He raises his children with his uh, sister-in-law, Bernice, and she's a complete feminist. Mm -hmm. Uh, And uh, there's one episode where they start arguing, and their argument argument, uh, takes on such a following that the men and the women of America split east to west (laughs) completely. There's a wall put between them. And... uh, um, uh, you know, eventually it comes back, but it's you know. Um, I think MGTOW are. I think Duckman is, is definitely the MGTOW hero in the nineties. Well, good for him. Okay, <laughs> we've about about time now to wind up, and I'm I've, I've loved talking to you, and thank you for your honesty and your understanding. And I hope that an awful lot of, of people, men and women, who if they get a chance to listen to this particular show will understand where you're coming from because it's so liberating to know that you're not alone. It's like that moment when you fought, found Paul Elam. Suddenly yep. you knew that there are other people out there who think like you do. And yes. the world isn't as quite such a frightening, lonely place. Yeah, exactly. All right, Eric, do you have any fo- closing thought or final thoughts you want to share with us? Yeah, uh, you know, please, you know, I do everything I do, I came up onto this program, everything I do, I do to draw attention to the fact that I am here in Edmonton. And like Aaron said, it is to, it, it is to, to make people feel less alone, it is to, uh, um, it is to draw like-minded individuals to myself on a geographic level, uh, rather than an internet level, as why yeah. as writes Edmonton, and our... Uh, our that 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 uh, um, that template has been uh, has been reproduced across North America and in Australia. Uh, there's a men's rights uh, Ireland now. Um, uh, anybody listening to this show, just pitch your tent and tell. If you build it, they will come. That's absolutely right. Men's Rights Edmonton, well, I mean, there have been men's groups before, but Men's Rights Edmonton was the first to get real notice on the Internet while still being a local group, and they've been they've inspired the existence now of Men's Rights Melbourne, Men's Rights Ireland, uh, Men's Human Rights Ireland, I believe they go by now. Um, men's Rights Northern Ireland exists now, too. 
Um, Men's Rights Australia to cover all of Australia is starting, and they're opening chapters in Sydney and a few other places. Um, Eric's a real inspiration there. Um, so definitely do that. Be sure to check out the Vanguard Report on AVFM Radio on Mondays. Next week, Tales from the Infrared will return from the Christmas holidays to talk about the Doctor Who Christmas special, uh, the return of uh, uh, Gotham, The Walking Dead, and Gamergate and all the usual geeky stuff. And we will see you all here in two weeks uh, on When Did You Wake Up with Aaron Pitsy. Hey, James, you want to take us home? You have been listening to When Did You Wake Up with Aaron Pitsy. We would like to thank James Huff, Paul Elam, and the A Voice for Men community for their support of this show. If you like what you hear and would like to continue to hear more, donations can be made on the front page of A Voice for Men. That's www.avoiceformen.com. Our theme music is Space 1990B by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com. That's I-N-C-O-M-P-E-T-E-C-H.com. And is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution License 3.0. And will be noted in the show notes on YouTube. Thank you for listening.